Four six complex zeros and the fundamental theorem of algebra. Last part, I think, of the chapter. Uh, what we're going to do is work backwards now. So we're going to look at some factors and write uh, polynomial functions for them. And part of that uh, uses the conjugate pairs theorem. And the conjugate pairs is fairly simple. It says if you have a zero at a plus b i, then its conjugate pair or its complex conjugate is what they call it here. A minus b i is also a zero of f. So if 5 plus 2i is a 0, then 5 minus 2i is a 0, and that's what they're trying to tell you here. Um, that should ring a bell if you think back to the quadratic formula. Okay. Anytime you get an answer that uses either the square root or the imaginary square root, which would be i, then it also includes the fact that you have a plus or minus. So anytime you have a plus 2i, it has to have a minus 2i. Or if it's a plus 2 square root of 3, you'd have a minus 2 square root of 3. Out of this then follows the, follows the corollary. And the corollary just means that, you know, given this first theorem, then this has to be true as well. I already referenced this. Uh, an odd degree with real coefficients has at least one real zero. Um, the reason you can say that then is if you have, for example, an x cubed, okay, we'll just do a very specific example, and you know that it has a 2 plus the square root of 3, and then it has to have a 2 minus the square root of 3, well, it has to have one more solution. It's a third degree. So, it, you know, where's its third answer? Well, the third answer would have to then be a real answer because you can't have an imaginary or another square root answer because that would imply that it has a, a partner or a conjugate pair. So that would give us four solutions for a three. Um, so that's one way that you can reason that. I think I just did it with n behavior. So if we know that n cubes have opposite n behavior, then we know that this has to be true. Well, to go from going up to going down, at some point, you're going to have to cross this thing over here, which is your x-axis. So there's your real zero. Now, you don't have to cross again, so you could finish it this way. But you definitely get one real zero. Okay. Let's look at an example. So we need to write a fifth degree polynomial, and these are the coefficients that are given. Um, just something come out here. So I think I eliminated C there. So we'll eliminate this one over here. Uh, we don't have to do the standard form. We just do the factored form. Okay, the first part is to find the remaining zeros. So zero is by itself. Negative 3i brings a positive 3i, and 2 plus 4i brings 2 minus 4i. Okay? That then allows me to write the factored form of the polynomial. So the factored form of the polynomial is based on the zero. So zero gets, just gives you x, and then it's x minus 3i, which actually is x plus 3i, but then that comes with its little friend, x minus 3i. And then the same thing happens on this last one. And this one's a little more annoying, and I do use brackets for a little while here, and uh, at some point you'll get used to this, hopefully. But... <laughs> I use them all the way through because I'm worried about this negative and the 2 here. So, And we'll do with that in a little bit. Let's look first at, at the x plus and the x minus 3i. So if I look at this, that is a plus b times a minus b. Well, that gives you a squared minus b squared. Okay, so x plus 3i times x minus 3i is going to give you x squared minus 3i squared. And that just gives you x squared minus 9i squared. And i squared is a negative 1. So that is x squared minus 9 times a negative 1. So that's actually x squared plus 9. Okay. So that's sort of the long way. Um, I usually don't write most of this. So to be honest with you, I usually write, definitely don't write this part. But I, I don't think you actually have to show me this. I think you could get away without showing that and just going straight from what I showed you there to this one over here. And that, that's showing enough work. You'll do enough of these, hopefully, that you'll see that it works initially. If you want to you know, work your way through that a little bit, then it would make sense to write it out. This one over here is a little more annoying. We'll do this in black initially. Um, I do need to distribute that negative 2 first. So that gives you x minus 2, and then this one gives you a plus 4i, and then that gives you an x minus 2, and then that's minus 4i. Well, that's another a minus a plus b, a minus b, um, except here you need to look at x minus 2, that's actually a, so this is a plus b, and then the other one should be a minus b, which it is, so it's x minus 2i, so that's a again, and then that's minus 4i, 
So hopefully you can see that this is an a plus b and an a minus b. So again, that gives you a squared minus b squared. Okay, so a squared will be x minus 2 squared minus b squared is 4i and then squaring that. Well, this is fairly straightforward, and so that's x min or sorry, x squared minus 4x plus 4, and then minus 16i squared. But that i squared gives you negative again. So um, usually I don't write that step, but hopefully you can see why this is going to be 4 plus 16i squared makes this negative 16 a positive. So ultimately, here's the whole factored form of the equation. So it's x squared minus 4x and 4 plus 16 is 20. So that is the factored form of a polynomial that has the zeros at 0, 3i minus 3i, 2 plus 4i, and 2 minus 4i. Um, you can't leave this stuff here. So when it says factored form, that is implied to mean then that it is factored over the real numbers. Okay. So if you're wondering why did I go all the way from here to there, if you can consider this as factors, which you can, uh, it's because when the book says factored form, or when I ask you write it in factored form, you, you can't leave imaginary parts or square root parts. So, so you have to do that part. Okay, let's look at another example. I'll try to write a little less and talk a little less. So hopefully you just sort of follow along. Fourth degree polynomial, should, it should have four zeros. Two plus the square root of three, that's two minus the square root of three, and a negative one minus, and a negative one plus the square root of five. So I got four zeros right now, it's a fourth degree, so there's nothing else there. Write the standard form of the polynomial. Uh, again, I forgot to change that, so I just want the factored form, but factored over the real numbers. So let's see what we have. So this is x minus two plus the square root of three, and then x minus 2 minus the square root of 3. And then it's x minus the negative 1 minus the square root of 5. And x minus the negative 1 plus the square root of 5. Um, again, I use these brackets still because I'm worried about this. Sometimes I forget to make this. This should be x plus 1, right? This negative makes that an x plus 1. So you actually get this over here. And then you get x plus 1 over here, and then you get minus the square root of 5. And then that would be your a minus b, and then it's your a. Sorry, on one of these you need to have a plus. So that's an a plus b, and that's an a minus b. So the shortcut this is would be this is actually x plus 1 squared minus the square root of 5 squared. So that's x squared plus 1x twice, so that's 2x, 1 times 1 is 1, minus 5. So that last one gives you x squared plus 2x minus 4. Let's see if we can go a little faster over here. So this would be x minus 2, that's a, minus the square root of 3 squared, so that's b. So that's a squared minus b squared. So that is x squared, not sure why I used the brackets there. Well, because I'm worried about factored form. So negative 2x twice plus 4 minus the square root of 3 squared is just 3. So the other factor is x squared minus 4x and 4 minus 3 is 1. So that is the factored form of the polynomial. Okay. So then we get to the definition of what, what are complex zeros and all of that. Um, and then the fundamental theorem of algebra. So let me try to put this sort of in, in, in words to you that maybe make a little more sense. Um, a complex number r is called a complex zero of f if fr equals zero. That just means that if you plug in, if I say that x equals a negative two is a zero, when I plug in a negative two, I should get zero. So that's the form that we've already used before. They're also saying that if x equals 2i is a 0, then when you plug in f of 2i, you should still get 0 out of that. Um, and technically, a negative 2 is considered an imaginary, is considered a complex number because it does have an imaginary part. And mathematicians in this case cheat a little bit, I think, and it may not really help 
that much, but it's consistent with the definition. So the number negative 2, which is real, does have an imaginary component. It just happens to be 0 times i. So that's why you always see this. So that makes this a, a working definition that then works for normal numbers and imaginary parts. Um, so we can use that then to sort of state the fundamental theorem of algebra, and that means that every complex polynomial function of a degree greater than or equal to 1 has at least one complex 0. For example, if I gave you f of x is x plus 1, okay, degree of 1, that has a 0. It's a complex, or it's, in this case it's a real 0, it would be at a negative 1, but you know, real numbers count as complex numbers. Uh, where one of the first times you really see this happening uh, that we're used to is maybe, you know, what about x squared plus 3? Well, if you think about that picture, x squared plus 3 looks a little bit like this, right? Okay, so it doesn't have any real zeros. But we, we do know it has two imaginary zeros. Okay, well, hopefully we know it has two imaginary zeros. If we solve the quadratic formula for this, you would get a plus or minus and then an i because it's completely above the x-axis. So that makes this, this theorem work again. Okay? All right. So how do we use this? to find complex zeros of polynomial functions. So now we're going to give you a function, and unlike in the previous section where we ended up with just real zeros, we, we, we also now have to solve for the complex zeros. And that's really the only difference between this and uh, 4, 5. So how do I do this? Well, I could try to factor it. I could try to use some, um, uh, use, you know, listing potential zeros, plugging it in. So for example, if I used 1, so 1 plus 2 is 3, this 1 is 4, so 1 didn't work. Um, and, but in this case, we're going to actually use technology. I don't want you to forget about that. So if you plug that in to GeoGebra, you would get a graph that looks like this. So there's the, the function. And that means that it looks to have a 0 at a negative 2 and 1 0 at a 2. What's well, a fourth degree? Does it have any more zeros? Well, right now, I can't really see that. So, um, you know, I'm just scooting this, changing it. And again, this is one reason I like GeoGebra so much. So it looks like there's sort of this weird little curve in here. So there might be an extra hump in here. So it, it looks like it only has two real zeros. So that means it has two imaginary zeros or, uh, as well. So we need to find that. So what did we say? Negative 2 and 2, I think. Let me unscoot this. So negative 2 and 2. So I'm going to say that a negative 2 is a 0. And then x is 2 is a 0 as well. Um, well, let's try and see if we can make confirm that. And I might as well use synthetic division because if it does give me a zero, then I'm on the right track. So what if a negative two was a zero? Then you can do this. And then this should give me a zero at the end. So hopefully it's right. So drop the one, so that's a negative two. So that's zero. So that's zero. So negative or one plus zero is one. So negative two times one is a Negative 2, add those two together, gives you a negative 10, and a negative 2 times a negative 10 is a positive 20, and add these together so you get 0. So a negative 2, that checked, that was one of the zeros. So let's see, what do we get with 2? So hopefully we get another 0. So drop it, 2 times 1 is 2, 0 plus 2 is 2, 2 times 2 is 4, 1 plus 4 is 5, 2 times 5 is 10, and a negative 10 plus 10 is 0. So that, that's what we're left with now. And keep in mind again, we did this a while back, but you know, if that was an x to the fourth, then we ended up with an x cubed here because that remainder means that we've got a cube, a square, an x, and a, um, a constant. So then we did one more synthetic division. So this was an x squared. So in essence, we're left with x squared plus 2x plus 5. The picture already showed you that it wasn't factorable. So the first question I'm actually going to answer is the 2 gives me an x minus 2 as a factor, and the negative 2 give, would have given you an x plus 2. So that's the factored form with integer coefficients of the polynomial that we started with. So there's question 1, or there's question the answer to question 2. I found two of the zeros, but I need to find the next two, and again, they came, or they will come from here. So you could complete the square in this. It's actually set up for it fairly well. So that would mean that you bring the 5 over over here. So then you get x plus 1 squared. So that's a negative 5. And then 1 squared is 1, so plus 1. So what do we have then? Complete the square on that. That gives you x plus 1 equals plus or minus the square root of a negative 4. And that actually breaks down really nicely. So that's a negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 4 is 2. The negative gives you an i. 
So there we go. So there are my other two zeros. So I have zeros there. And keep in mind that I have a zero to negative two and add a positive two as well. So all of the zeros are listed. Okay. All right. Um, what if you were specifically told not to use a graphing calculator? But in this case, you know, we were nice enough to, or fortunate enough to at least be given two i as a factor. Um, well, how can you use that? Well, if two i is a factor then you should be able to do synthetic division with it. And that's sort of, that's, that's the connection between the theorem that was up here and what we're actually trying to do. Okay, so if 2i is a zero, um, well, that gives me actually two things. It means that a negative 2i is also a zero, but it also means that if I use 1, a negative 4, 4, and a negative 16, and I put 2i over here, then that should give me a remainder of zero. So let's see. I've dropped a 1. 2i times 1 is 2i. So this is just a negative 4 plus 2i, right? And then 2i times a negative 4 is a negative 8i. And I'm out of room a little bit. So let's put the negative 16 a little further over there. So, so I need to do 2i times a negative 4 as a negative 8i, and 2i times 2i is plus 4i squared. Okay, so let me write that on the side. So what I'm trying to do is a negative 4 plus 2i times 2i. So negative 2 times a negative... Oh, not a negative 2i. I was using the positive 2i. So what we're trying to do is multiply this 2i with this over here. So 2i times a negative 4 is a negative 8i. And 2i times 2i is 4i squared. But actually, that means that you get a negative 4 out of it, right? So that's a negative 8i minus 4. And 4 minus 4 is 0. So those cancel. And then that just drops. And then now you do 2i times a negative 8i. Okay. So 2i times a negative 8i. And the next little side problem, 2i times a negative 8i. Well, that's a negative 16 i squared, and i squared is a negative 1, so that makes it a positive 16, and so you do end up with that 0. Hopefully that worked for you. You'll see me do that again, so I'll change colors so that you can maybe follow along a little bit better. So now I need to use this second 0, negative 2i, and I'm going to use synthetic division again. So the 1 drops, negative 2i times 1 is a negative 2i, so those cancel, so that becomes a negative 4, and a negative 2i times a negative 4 is a positive 8i. So that gives you negative 8, that gives you 0 again. So that's another 0. So what are you left with over here? Well, let's go back to the start. This was an x cubed, right? So this was an x cubed. And this was an x squared. And this is just a regular x. So this is 1x, which is just x minus 4. And if you need to solve that for 0, well, that's fairly straightforward. That gives you 4. So use the given zero to find the remaining zeros of the function without a graphing calculator. So what do we do? Zero given was 2i, so that's a negative 2i was the other one. So the positive 2i came with a negative 2i. And then we used synthetic division to come down and get another zero and four. And does that work with one of these other theorems that we have? So that's an odd degree, right? It has at least one real zero. So it seems to be pretty consistent. Hope it all makes sense. Now you guys get to go practice this. Thanks.